Hello legends, super legends. Welcome to Villa Home. Today is, uh, it rained all night. Uh, well, most of the night, I guess, from midnight to about probably 4 a.m. So it's wet outside. It may dry up later when we're out there, but I'm taking a cold Nago. I've got mud guards on it. I don't want any kind of spray on me. And I'm going to be wearing these shoe covers I got, totally reflective. So with this material, should keep my shoes not only clean, but if we do get any rain while riding, it will protect me. Um, I decided to go with an old school look back in the day with the little knickers with the white inserts on there made by Rafa. These are my Prevent jersey and then the team kit. I've worn this once before. I put the picture on uh, this combination on Strava. It just looked really good. And this is a, just a regular Rafa cap. I'm gonna wear my black helmet with it. Should be ready to go. So Paul should be here soon. We're gonna roll in about 10 minutes. I'm just wearing regular gloves because uh, it's about uh, 59 Fahrenheit, which is right around probably 12 or 13 C, I'm estimating. Uh, so it's not gonna be very cold. It's a cool day. I'm still covering my knees, but we're going to do a long ride. And uh, I'm hoping we can find a group to film for you guys, but we may not. Because once it get, the road gets wet, people fickle out, fickle out around here. So uh, we'll see. If we find a group, I'll film a little bit of them, but then I'm going to film Paul and I riding on our adventure today. Because we're doing a long ride. So I've got a bunch of food here to carry. Lots of bars, my banana bread and a couple of gels. I always slip in at least two gels, just in case. But uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get ready. On this ride, Paul and I left Northampton. We weren't sure there'd be anybody at the ride start, so we just rolled by. And there were some riders, you can see Greg, and uh, Doug shot. There were other riders there as well. As we headed out, Mo and his group latched onto the back of our group. Got on Fish Creek, good clip, lots of attacks, accelerations. It should be pretty interesting. There were a lot of splits. We got into Montgomery. We took a little cool down loop, hooked up with the boys, went through the forest, and went south on 149, the Bailey Grove Road, out to Dacus. At Dacus, we took 1486 into Dobbins. At this point, Paul and I split from the group and went through the Tri Lakes area. There's a lot of climbs in there. And we got tired of all the waiting. We're waiting for people who have pulled and then gotten dropped. So they need to learn to, to not pull and just sit in the stuff I talk about all the time. So it was just eating into our day. And we had planned to do a six hour ride. So, you know, we ended up wasting like 45 minutes with a bunch of waiting and stopping. So we picked up some water at the park over there, Sterling Ridge, and continued the route through the woodlands back to the house. I hope you all got a chance to get out there and get some K's in. It was a very cool day, very pleasant. I hope you enjoy the clips. Old school. Right there. <laughs> no, no, so I start riding. Clean his lens, I know it's, yeah, it's misty. You can call on those dreams. I went to Cimarron. Yeah. Yeah. Very strange. That's a nice little neighborhood. Not fun. Yeah. So now that yeah. I've used those for a while, are those really helping? So everybody's got low inflation this morning. At any turn we go That's what gets to me if you ride in the for a long time. All I'm thinking about right here is it's five minutes past 7.30. We need to be going. That's all on my mind. Moving time. So we shouldn't have breathed a bit. So I'm just freaking out. The wind's going to pick up too. So it'll be nice when we go. I'm just trying to figure out where to go. Let's go to Taco and figure it out. I don't know how I'm going to feel. This bike is a bit of a boy. We'll have to back up where it's at. 
the bike is the engine. Yeah, that's, that's no, no. <laughs> it's, 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 it's Paul is talking about he's got his pounds. rain bike in his head. <laughs> it's crazy. I thought I said my bike 23 pounds with my water bottles on it. I got the Colnago. But whatever they say, we'll go to Taco and figure it out. That's a day where they're going to be waiting around. So when I heard that, I was like, hmm, we're going to have to make some executive decisions today. Yeah, you no, you, I think you have a separate, separate house. Yeah, you you He's yeah, talking about my kid again. It's like, you got to represent. He said, I must have a separate house for my kid. I thought I said, you got to represent. You got to look the part. That's why you said, the police officers that you're the military guy. I told him to the police, military, they got to look the part. Teaching them, you got to represent. Whatever you do, you got to do it. You got to look the part. You know, in certain homes, you get beat up for looking raggedy. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, come on, man. If my dad didn't play, you're going to you're gonna, you're gonna do something, do it right, or don't do it at all. That's the way I was raised. Go halfway. So they're laughing. Put the camera on you, man. And Doug, this is Doug. Doug is clean. Uh, you're not going to see his socks here, but I will, I will, I will point it out. Doug has matching socks with the color of his jersey, and it's got some lines, black lines that match the short. What's wrong, Rich? So we refer, and his brother over there, Greg, also. That's what started Paul H. his comment when Greg showed up. He said, oh, this guy dresses up like from Eldred School of Fashion or something like that. But Greg, the boys look the part. So let's go, man. I, yeah, so, so we're rolling. Victor didn't want to hear it. He rolled off. That's what Paul's messing with him. So uh, you will see shortly. There's there's Doug. Look at his socks. Now Doug could have just worn the the green jersey. It probably would have worked. But look how much more effective it is having that color on his legs and the jersey. You'll see when he's pedaling. That's what the pro teams do, guys. I didn't create this. They hire professionals to put their kit together for them. If you watch a lot of the top teams, they pick up a color. Look, look at look how effective he looks with the two green. The green on his legs and then the jersey. It just enhances that jersey. That jersey could be 10 years old. It wouldn't matter. With those socks, it pops. That's what Paul H was giving us a hard time about. He makes a comment every week. But I think it's because he just he looks forward to seeing what we're going to put together. I look at all the stuff I have and I get a sock here and an arm warmer here. And I just it spices up my old stuff. Those things are old. You know, but it just wakes them up. And so Doug Shot said, oh, I don't look that. I said, no, you look fine. Because he was downplaying it. it. It works. See, his brother, his brother wore dark socks. That, he's the one that Paul H. saw and started talking about fashion. He, said, he must be from the Elder School of Fashion. But you can see his jersey now. And you can also see his socks, even though it's black. Because what he did is, by, by going black, that jersey with the stripes on it and the arm, it stands out. So now you see everything. If he had worn some busy socks that didn't match, it would have looked too busy. But it worked. And when Paul A saw him, he said, oh, this guy must be from the, from the Elder School of Fashion. What Paul was saying, in effect, was, I like the way Greg looks. It, it, in, in a roundabout way, it's a compliment. Because he looked at Greg's outfit, he's like, man, this works. It worked. He's got a jersey that stands out and the black stands out. His bike is black. All of that blends in. And you see the back of his shoe. So as he goes down the road, you see those whites on the back of his shoe. They stand out. That's what I'm talking about. And so I explained the far. I said, it's not accidental. The Paul H. I said, I plan my outfits. You guys know that. The night before. You don't have time in the morning to start thinking about stuff. It needs to be close. You might change one or two things in the morning. But at least the basic stuff you're going to wear, put it out. The weather controls that this time of the year. I mean, all year, really. You got to know what the weather's doing. But yeah, anything you're going to do, put some thought into it. Don't do it halfway. So there are the two brothers right there. You know, Doug with his green. Got little black stripes running around it. Looks good. You look the business, they will take you seriously when you're out there. If you were an officer and you wore a dirty uniform, I mean, you just will be giving the, the police force a, 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 a bad rep or military. That's why they don't play. In the military, they don't care what about you making up your bed. It's a process. They're teaching you to take everything seriously. When they say make up your bed the way we can drop a coin on it. That's what they're talking about. It's not about the bed. It's about you understanding that everything matters. 
Your shoes need to be polished. Your uniform needs to be right. You know, all of that. That's what they're talking about. Whatever you're going to do, do it well. Or you might as well not bother. The right tool for the job. So we roll out here. And uh, the road is damp, as you can see. And even though it rained last night, it's not raining now. These are the roads that will get you dirty when you don't have mud guard. All these guys got dirty. We did our best to stay out of their spray. You will even hear Paul say that. I mean, we got music playing on that track, but basically we, we avoid following too closely like when, it, when it's like this. But they like following us. We had uh, Maurice tell Paul, oh, I'm glad I'm following you. So they benefit from the mud guards on our bike, but then Victor made the comment, he referred to my bike as a beach cruiser when I when I when I was in the parking lot there and so what I told him was well you're slow so I brought the beach cruiser because it's easy to keep up with you anyhow <laughs> you know you're not gonna take a pot shot at me and get, get away with it you know so you see that water all of that all of them had dirty bums dirty bikes everything was filthy because some of the roads we go on they got mud dirt sand whatever and you, all you do is you pick it up it gets on your shoes and whoever's following you it gets in their face right here i'm trying to kind of warm up my body we, we stood in the parking lot let's see it's 7:45. we're there for probably 10 minutes minimum and even though we had ridden there you kind of cool off you know it's not a particularly cold morning but all i'm doing is trying to wake up my legs kind of get going here Although my Colnago is heavier than my other bikes, I really don't notice too much of a difference. Like I've said before, if I were participating in a hill climb or mountain climb, yeah, I'd probably use something lighter. But on these roads, the Colnago holds its own. I love how comfortable it is. Just behaves differently. They're all different. You know, and they use the this is the Master X, whatever the tubing is that they use is supposedly lighter, but People put too much emphasis on weight away from where you're fighting gravity. Just on everyday riding, it doesn't matter that much. But at the top levels, yeah, you need, you need to get the lightest possible stuff comparable to your competitors. But just riding around, I, I just love steel. That's what I raced on in the late 80s and most of the 90s. So, I'm just, you know, I love it. So right about here, I think I back off in a little bit. You see my cadence high, whatever. I just got my legs to wake up a little bit. But even though the roads look damp, you see all the water spots. That's what gets you dirty when you don't have uh, mud guards on your bike. So even after the rains have passed and you have no protection on your bike, it was it, will be, it might as well you probably better off riding in the rain because it'll be cleaner. Because right now it's just dirt you're gonna pick up and nothing to wash the road per se. So I, I don't miss not having all that spray on my rear and then you get home and the water's black when you wash your shorts. We're turning right here. They have repaved. Those of you who saw last week's group ride where Paul asked, I thought this road was smooth. They had scraped it up and now we see why. They have laid down new pavement. So there's two lanes going to be on each side. Where you see those barrels, they're going to put two lanes to the left of those barrels. Right now we have two lanes to the right of the barrel. So we have two lanes in either direction. A total of four lanes. Greg goes to the left. I'm not sure why, uh, but I guess because that's closed. And he just wants the road to himself. He's up there riding. But that side is close to traffic. They've moved the traffic to this right side now as they paved the other side. So when they're done, this little old Egypt road stretch will be nice. They need to do the southern part of this to the opposite of where we turn because it's all chewed up. And I tell Paul, new road. <laughs> I tell him, new road. <laughs> They've got a few spots where they drop the asphalt. They got little asphalt balls and it gets hard on this side. Hopefully they'll chip that out, but sometimes they just leave them there. And when you're riding your bike, they're like mini speed bumps. You guys know what I mean. They're almost like rocks because the asphalt just clunked where they dropped it. 
they made really good transitions like that driveway transition that there's no lip and the same thing where up the road you will see as it transitions to the concrete of highway 1488 which is about half a kilometer up the road they made the transition really smooth but sometimes those transitions are not very smooth they're like a bump told Paul I said he was just talking about how this road wasn't it smooth last week I said I guess they heard you and they smoothed it out you know and uh, more and I would uh, more came across me while I was riding last Thursday and uh, we rode together for a little while and he was saying that we're very fortunate yeah. that's the transition I'm talking about how it gets to the concrete he said we're very fortunate that a lot of these roads are being kept up so yeah they, they're spending money on the roads that we ride on and it, it benefits us so we really appreciate it that so I want to just kind of make that note. At this life, I begin to hear Mo's voice. Because, you know, he didn't start with us. They have their start at the, Wash the Ashling YMCA. So I hear his voice. And you will see Paul will turn the camera around here. At this point, I'm not looking behind. There's Mo. I think I froze the frame. Mo's on the left and Jerry's on the right. I don't know they're there yet. I'm looking forward. I'm adjusting the cinch in my jersey. And so, but I begin to hear more. He's talking with people. I hear his voice. And I'm like, you know how you hear somebody that you don't expect to be there, but it's their voice. And I'm like, I hear Mo in my mind. And then you will see Paul will spin the camera around again. And then I turn around to confirm what I'm hearing. And he's there and I wave. I say, yeah, I know I heard you. <laughs> you know, so that was so cool. It was like I could hear him talking. I said, I'm hearing somebody I know. That's cool. So, you know, guys, uh, I learned this week, like I already suspected, not from more directly, I learned from Greg Shot on this ride at one of the stops that uh, Mo made his living as a professional bicycle racer. You know, Mo's our age now, you know. But uh, I'm just letting you guys know we have a former pro riding with us. I kind of suspected it, but Mo doesn't talk about himself that much. And I don't like the pry, so it's kind of cool, you know, but he, Doug just confirmed, uh, not Doug, uh, Greg, Doug's brother just confirmed what I suspected. Uh, because you can just watch him ride and know that the, the talent is still there. You know, he still dab dabbles in races. And he told me on Thursday that he tries to keep the races within an hour and a half by car. So he's not using up the entire weekend, you know, family time and other stuff that can intrude. So that's that's what he's into now. He, he he goes to races that are under an hour and a half from where we live by car, one way. So all the regional stuff, he'll do it. Like Darius, I think he's gonna do one in Huntsville coming up, near Huntsville, where we rode our bikes. It's not very far from where we live. And then he might go up to other places that are, I know he does the, the Chapel Hill stuff, because it's not far. Anything hour and a half or so, which makes sense. It's like the same stuff Paul and I do for our grand fundos. We'll go to grand fundos that two hours or less from where we live. Because that stuff just eats into your time if you have to drive. Texas is so big. It was just cool to learn that. I was riding on Thursday and all I hear was, who's sneaking out at lunch? I, I, and I turned my head, it was Mo. I was going up a climb in the area. And so we rode together for about a half hour or so. And then he had to go back to the office. So it was kind of cool. So that's imagine you're riding in your neighborhood and Chris Froome comes along <laughs> and rides with you for about 45 minutes. Isn't that cool? So we went through some area and I told Mo, I said, I haven't ridden this area called Cimarron. I said, I haven't ridden this, place, this area that fast. So we're gonna do more of his rides because uh, that's how you get better. To take our riding to the next level, we're just gonna we'll mix it up. You know, that's why we hooked up with these guys this week. And you can see Mo is here. He's on the back. You don't see him too much. I mean, they come around us later when we get out on the open road and they go off. They're riding a different pace. We're doing Paul and I are doing about 162 kilometers, so we've got our own little program. So we don't really try to keep up with his group, but you see them, and I point them out. We're all heading out in the same general direction. We branch out and do different things once we get out. 
so it's kind of cool to have somebody of his quality and just that excellent individual the breath of fresh air I'm always glad to see him it always brings my, a smile to my face you guys know people like that that you see them just happy to see them it's kind of nice. so as we head out uh, I begin to observe that uh, this is uh, Greg, Greg Schott this is the guy who had the uh, mechanical with the DI2 a few weeks back with Mo's group, very strong rider. We're rolling up, he's drifting back, he's probably gonna hang with Jerry and Mo back there and chat. But I had told Paul we're going to stay on the back and Paul told me later, he said when he saw me do this, he's like, what are you doing, where's my wheel? I thought we were supposed to stay back. But uh, I was just staying on the wheel that was in front of me, I didn't want to sit in the wind. And so all I did was I, I rode with the wheel I was following, which at this moment, it was Paul H. So there's only three of us up here. You'll see Paul Longa ride up to us. But uh, Doug Shot is at the front. Doug Shot is at the front. And he's... Uh, he's riding in a very good spot on the road. You notice we're using the road. I thought, wow, that's really cool. But what he told me later, we chatted about it, he said he looked for the driest spot on the road and he felt that being at the front was going to be the cleanest place to be because nobody has mud guards other than Paul and I. So his reason for being at the front right now is because he wants to stay clean and out of the spray. That's why he's there. I'm sitting on, look, look at where I am, it's dry, that's where he is. So he was looking for the driest spot and he didn't want to be behind anybody. Paul H is on the right, I'm avoiding Paul H because he has no, no, no protection on his bike and he's creating those rooster tails. Even though you don't see a lot of water on the road, there's water toward the right where the white line is. And whenever possible, when he goes through water, there were rooster tails. You can see the shine. There's water on the right near that line. And he was periodically riding there, so I made sure I stayed out of there. Got a little bit of spray on me from time to time. Nothing significant. You could just kind of wipe it off, but I, that, that's the reason. Uh, whenever possible, I stayed back. I didn't follow people too closely. I ended up uh, falling off of Moe's and then Pace when we get out on Rayburn Chapel because I was following back and behind the wrong people that let gaps open and it's just it would have taken too much energy for our purpose for this day to go up the more and them and since we really weren't riding their same route i didn't expend the energy to get up there but right now by staying to the left of these guys i'm avoiding the spray and so paulie longa is right behind me You can see the water from my car. You see a little bit, of, you see specks of water getting on the camera there. Paul was very, Paul Ilonga was concerned about that. We didn't want to get the view of the camera obscured or anything. Right here, you see me back off those guys. There's a lot of water on the shoulder and it's just coming up. A lot of them were dirty. All of them got dirty. The shorts, the saddle, some of them have saddle bags back there. It was all dirty with mud and you know. So that's the thing that I don't get. I think everybody should have mud guards when it's wet. It doesn't weigh anything significant. It's easy to attach on bikes that are not made with permanent eyelets. So there's no excuse to not have them. And it just works, keeps you clean. I can ride and come home clean, even when it's wet. Especially after on a day like this, it's dry. And because you don't have one, you end up getting dirty on a dry day. So it's kind of funny. So all I do is I stay to the left or right of where Paul H is because he's spraying water wherever he rides with it when there's water. You can see the little bit of water if you look at my wheel. So even though the road appears to be dry, there's water. See, I go to the right because I don't want him spraying. And that's why Paul Ilonga is backing off a little bit because some of the spray from Paul H can get on the camera even though he's not directly following me. That's why when it rains, we don't we don't like to ride in a group. It's just Paul and I, we just do our own thing. That was our plan today anyway, because I didn't think these guys were gonna ride. They, uh, they posted on their board that 
they, they, it was kind of like iffy, you know, it might rain and it's supposed to be wet and whatever. So I just told them, I said, without mud guards, you might as well just do the trainer. Yeah. You know. I want to be able to ride when my schedule permits. I don't want the weather to stop me unless it's dangerous. That's why I have things that allow me to ride in inclement weather as well as when the weather's fair. Because in the summer, it's very hot. So you can't say, oh, it's too hot. I don't want to ride if you only have heavy jerseys. So you need to get lighter jerseys. That's what Paul Ilonga just said. He doesn't want to be a, behind anyone that's going to spray water all on him. You get your nice kid all dirty. So you see right there now, I noticed Paul H. I'm not sure why he's on the right because he's not getting benefit of any drive. Maybe he's trying to stay out of the water, but where Doug is, is dry. I ride up the Doug here. And Paul H. is sitting on the shoulder with no wind protection at all. I don't get that. And I think all of this adds up to him paying for it because there's a lot of things that occur during this ride. After like the third time to wait for him, uh, Paul and I decide to just go because we're just, we're getting late. There were just too many stops. And I will explain as we go. So right now you see him on the ride getting no benefits. So I ride up since he's not gonna take advantage of the drop. I'm going to get get in the draft. So you can see Paul Yolonga is behind me. And where Doug is riding, the, the pavement is dry. There's not much spray coming from him. And that's what he told me. He intentionally positioned himself there. But this is what I talk about all the time. Look at the volume of traffic on this road. One car, Saturday morning, one car once in a while. That's the way we're supposed to be riding. You see Victor, that's Victor's wheel on the left. Victor stays either at the back or off to the side because he's on his time trial bars, and that's fine. But we own this lane, so you don't have to worry about cars. On a, on the, on a road like this, light traffic, take the lane. And, and they just, they got that lane, we got this lane. No question, it's clear to everybody. That's the way you want to do it. When I ride solo out on this road, doesn't matter what day of the week, I ride where you see Doug is. So they know I'm using this lane. If you want to pass in my lane, you still got to move over because I'm in this lane. I don't want them to think I'm riding off the road. There's no reason for that. So Doug ends up staying up here for quite a while. Um, and you know, he explained to me why. He just he wanted to stay clean. Because if you're following people on a wet road, you get sprayed. That made sense to me. So, it's a good pace that we're holding here. I'm at the top of my endurance zone, a little below tempo. I stay very close to Doug because I want to make sure I'm only working as hard as is necessary. You can see I'm about a foot or less, very close. Doug's very easy to follow, he's a smooth rider. I'm letting people know the light's changing. I back off early enough because this light is short. We're all aware of that and I think it changes before we get there. Right there, you see it turns green. And Doug had been there for a while. He's soft pedaling, so I decided to go ahead and take the lead there. And this is probably confusing to Paul because I had told him that we were going to stay behind, but I'm already here. The pace is not that hard. I decided to just go ahead and give Doug a break. And you see Doug just slip behind me because it just makes sense. And then he tells me, I'm glad I'm following you. So it's consistent with our discussion later at the stop where he said he wanted to stay. I just nodded my head when he told me I'm glad I'm following you because he's going to stay clean. And, and Doug went ahead and asked me a lot of questions at the stop about the mud guards, how they're attached, you know, whether they're adjustable. And I think it was probably one of the rides after we left the, the first stop during the ride. He was asking a lot about the mud guard, so I didn't get a chance to tell him that I made a video about it. 
but he was very interested in the mud, mud garden because you know Doug rides a lot. He and his brother Greg. Paul's got you see Mo on the right there. That's Mo on the right with the white arm ones and the orange jersey. stay up here as long as Doug did. I think in a little while I end up pulling off and Doug ends up going back to the front. Nobody really comes through per se. You can hear the guys chatting behind us, more than them talking. This is not very hard for them. Paul does not want to follow Doug very closely because he wants to make sure the camera does not get a lot of spray on it. Because every now and then you'll hit a little spot where the people that have no mud guards, they flick up something. So you can see Paul's a little to the left here. He's doing his best to keep, you can see the water off of Doug's tire. There's a little bit on the road. That's enough to flick stuff on the camera. You can see the top right of the screen, the camera has some moisture on it. It came off of somebody's wheel, because it's not raining at all. But it's, everything's from the road. And now you got a good view of Doug's socks with the black blinds in it, matching the jersey, and how effective that is. I think it looks really good when you break it up like that. You're very visible. I, you can see the black and the green when you break it up like that. The shoe covers I'm wearing are the Rafa Reflective shoe covers. I wore it, I think, last Sunday when I rode with Alan, and he was saying that it was so effective. The sun changes the color. You'll see that on this ride when Paul and I are riding solo, and he films it, and you'll see what it looks like in the sunlight. It's amazing how it, it lights up, and the, the material it's made of keeps water from getting on your shoes. So they did a good job. They didn't do much of a write-up on it. I think they undersold it, really. There's a lot more it does than what they told us about. It's more than just reflective, it's also protective. This is a climb as Ridge Lake Shores were passing. There I pull off after the climb. And I slip right behind Doug. Nobody's there, so I just catch the wheel. It's better than me sitting out in the wind longer than I need to. I'm staying a little to the right. There's a little bit of moisture here, so I'm just staying a little to the right. The effort is up. We're, we're going a little harder. Driven by the terrain for the most part. It's not super windy at this point. Those of you who saw last week's group ride, I just wanted to point out uh, early in the ride when Randy was falling off the pace, if you remember, he looked like he was spinning a bit excessively. And I did not comment on it during that video. I wanted to just mention that. It just seemed like his gear was a little low. You see how those things light up when the sun hits them? Look at that. It's like the color changes completely. The pink kind of disappears. The entire shoe just becomes a beacon of reflectivity. Look at that. Imagine what it does in headlights. And that's the sunlight doing that. So the, the power's on here, and I'm just staying in the same gear, and I'm spinning it faster. But what I was talking about, Randy, was at some point, you have to be able to turn a larger gear. And he stayed in a small gear the whole time, and he was still not making any progress. Now, that's either because he did, does not have the strength to turn a larger gear, or simply chose not to shift into a larger gear, or didn't know that he should shift into a larger gear. Because the way he was spinning, it gets you out of breath. You're just spinning and going nowhere. The gear's too small, and you need to use your strength. And at that point, if your if your legs get, just can't turn it, then you let that group go, and you go and you work on the ability to turn larger ratios. I wanted to point that out here. Just.
just because people say uh, spinners are winners or winners are spinners does not mean that you sit there spinning and not making any progress. At some point it becomes ineffective and inefficient to spin a very small gear at excessive cadences. And that was what, what was happening to him and you know, I'm not sure what the reasoning was. Maybe he just could not go higher in the gear ratio. But I think going higher brings your breathing under control and you use more of your leg strength. And then if you find you can't do that, then you gotta focus on your training and strengthening your legs. Because on a long climb, you don't wanna excessively spin. You need to be able to balance the blend between strength and finesse. So Doug spent a large part of this ride just sitting at the front here. I just sat on him um, back in zone one here. Well, it's crept in zone two, so bottom of zone two. So that's that's my all day endurance pace. But that's according to my heart rate. My legs are saying they're working and the heart rate has to keep up. You can see it's going back up now. And the reason I am using my high cadence here, I'm still under control. I'm not breathing erratically because I've trained to be able to tolerate those cadences. It's when you exceed what you can tolerate that you get in trouble. And besides, the overpass is coming. So you don't want to work too hard before a critical point. That over, overpass is about three to three and a half percent at its peak, and it's long. So if you get that tired, it, it, it seems like a much longer climb than it is. See the water split, just split off of my bike right there. That's what gets you dirty long after the rains are gone. Yeah, we're, we're riding fairly hard here and I'm spinning. I'm in a reasonable ratio. I'm on a small chain ring, probably a 39, 15 or something like that. That's Victor and Dan that come by. I just ignore them and hold my tempo because I know we're going at a fairly good pace. I know they're not gonna make much progress. They're not riding with the group, you just ignore them because they're doing their own thing. Whatever the reasoning is, it doesn't make any sense. We're going hard enough to where I know they're not gonna go anywhere. Doug's riding really well, I didn't need to go around it. You can see right here we're coasting and I hope the camera gets them. They're right there. They did not, they wasted a lot of energy and went nowhere. That's the stuff I'm talking about. It, it much more of a show than anything. That was not a very efficient or effective move. I'm hoping the camera picks them up. You can see them between our legs. Right there. They did all that work. It takes a lot of work to come around us like they did. They expended a lot of energy for very little gain. That's my point. Don't do that. It looks cool, but you pay the price later. If this were a race and you, you wasted that kind of energy, when it mattered, you wouldn't have anything to be able to go with the real move. Plus, you got the heavy hitters more and them sitting behind there. You know, when they decide to go, then you're not going to be able to go. And watch, you will see what happens. Remember, Victor did it. He's up there, but he's not, he's maybe less than a car length. Dan is not even with him. And Dan was going with him. And there's a, there was a gap between Dan and Victor. So Dan did not even stay with Victor. And now Dan is sitting right in front of Doug. The road's narrow, we didn't go around them, but Victor's also right there. So all that energy they wasted, they did not gain anything. I don't know what that was about. I know we're riding six hours today, so I'm not gonna waste my energy doing anything that is futile. You see Victor's right there. Now what happens as we turn, there's, there's a turn coming up off a of capital road. That's the reason I did not go around Doug. Doug was holding a good pace. He was under control. He looked like he could do it for a while. He was not faltering. And I didn't need to lift my pace to follow those two. They're right there. They didn't come and give us a wheel, so I don't understand what that was about. I put my hand out because you want to be careful. The road's damp. You don't want to lean your bike. 
You see my turn? Why? My bike is basically upright. You learn that from riding in the wet. When it's wet like that, you don't want to be leaning your bike. Now right here, Victor needs to rest, and I know that. So I decide I'm gonna just keep the pace that Doug was doing. They're calling that car, I'm now in this path. I just keep riding. And you can see he's carrying a big gear, low cadence. You ride like that, you're not gonna get up the hill faster than somebody who's in the right gear. You see all those boys just hanging back, they're waiting, Jerry, Mo, all of them. We're just riding here. I'm not doing anything extravagant. I'm right at the bottom of my tempo zone. And I'm just riding. I'm holding the pace we we're holding on the overpass. And just continuing continuing that pace with no respite. That's all I'm doing here. Because that's what the pack would do. So if you go too hard and you can't continue, you will be off the back. Because the pack won't slow down. So I'm holding the train pace here. So this part of the road is a descent. I love this climb coming the opposite way. It's a long climb. It gets up, I think, to like 6%. It's called, that's why they call it Capitol Hill Road. So all of this that we're descending is a climb from the other direction. So wherever you ride, if you're descending in one direction, the next time you do that route, try it the opposite way. So that descent becomes a climb. Imagine this, this is how long we've been descending. All the way where you see those curves. So when we're coming the opposite way, it's a nice climb. I'm not working hard up there. I'm off the front because Victor just chose to stay back here. I'm not going hard. That's Doug, I mean Greg shot on the left. I can tell by his sleeves. His sleeves match his jersey. It's a nice design. I chose to do that just to show Victor that when you go, you better have something in the tank. But we're not gonna come queue up behind you. We're gonna keep our pace. The car parked over here. And then we get a guy who is very impatient in a, uh, a truck. Well, a small truck, I guess you could say. Not, not a dumb truck. I'm blowing my nose there. Keep the tempo the same. You can see my effort stayed about the same. I just do that by feel. I don't see my heart rate when I'm riding. I don't have time to look at that. I don't look at any data. I only use the clock for the most part in my cadence. From time to time, I glance at cadence. But I'm just riding. I'm not worried about what Victor's doing. Car up! Car back! So there's a car back, car up. That's Dan going up there again. This is the guy who's impatient. Now look, there's a car coming. He should be behind the cyclist waiting. No, he's special. So he's forced to move over now. And I mean, what is the hurry? And there's somebody in the group wrongfully so talking about we're not making any friends. We don't need to make any friends. We're using the road. When you come up, you, regardless of how the group spread out, you pass when the road is safe. He ain't, he ain't going nowhere. There's no emergency, there's no life at stake. You know, they just get on the road and act like nobody else is supposed to be on the planet because they're driving someone. So I told whoever it was, I said, no. In driver's ed, they tell you how to pass. Get over! Where's their diesels? Yeah, that's what they're talking about. I don't need to make any friends. So now they slow down here and you'll see Mo come and say, let's go, let's go. Because we're on the road. I don't know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, Mo, Mo said, let's go, let's go. That's Mo, that's Mo going up there. Mm-hmm. It's not the place to stand and chat. That's Dave, he rides with Mo. He's going up the Mo. And then you see Doug on the right and Maurice is on the... I'm just watching the sea, so I ride up here. Now, because of this lag and they sat by and let Mo go up there, now we're gonna have to chase up. I'm looking for Paul. I know there are hills coming, so you can see the... I'm using high cadence here to keep my legs my muscles supple because it's, it's easier to recover when you're trained properly from the high cadence taxing your aerobic system than wearing out your leg muscles you can see the speed we're putting down here we're going in up a gray what we call ninja gray when more of them are right up there so at this point i'm thinking okay we're going to get back together 
rightfully so we end up doing it but i'm thinking okay we're doing all this work to get back together i don't i didn't expect these guys to do all this work and let them ride off again but that's what ends up happening anyway you'll see We're already together. I think we've, we've ridden up to them. And it's not the whole group that's together. Paul is with me. I don't know who's behind Paul. I didn't look. There's a bunch of people back there. You'll see some of them come around after we get through the four-way stop sign coming up. But we're together with Mo's group. We had to work hard to do that. Every time I looked for Paul, he was right there. I just wanted to make sure this stuff was being documented because I knew we weren't going to stay with the group the whole day for, you know, because we're going further than they are. And they had planned to go to Taco Corner and then chat there. And I didn't want to stand around. There's Mo right there in the orange jersey at the front. So we're all together here. And then right at the stop sign, you will see the gap open and how easily it opened without them trying. They're just riding. Mo's not trying to ride away from anybody. You see Mark on the left there? Pay attention to him. Now, this other genius passes at the intersection. I don't know which driver's ed school taught him that. That's the first thing they tell you not to do. Now, right there, watch Mark on the left there. Watch it. He's on a big gear. Mo and them are riding off. I'm not even paying attention. I was looking back for, for, for Paul to make sure he was there to document stuff. Now you see Mark, look, he's waving people through. He should have done that a long time ago. Look at Victor, Mr. Attacker. Can't even keep up with those guys. This is what I'm talking about. He burned all his matches on that overpass. Now look at the gap. By the time I realize that, I tell Paul, make sure you're getting this on film. That, that's what I'm telling Paul right here. I said, make sure you're getting it on film. Paul said, yeah, I got it. Those guys ride with more than them. They're going around the ride up there. I'm not going to expend any energy to get up there because, like I said earlier, we're, we're going further than more than them. We started with these guys. But had I cared to ride with more than them, I probably would have paid more attention to being up there because they're not, they're, they're up, they're already climbing and we're coming to the hill. But to get up to them, look at where they are. They're probably done with the first hill. We're still at the base of the climb. I don't understand why Mark sat there, let the gap open there, wave them through. This is what I'm talking about. They're not paying attention. Now look at him killing himself on this climb. Why didn't he do that to sit on mowing them? This is what I talk about all the time. Misplaced effort. Doing the effort at the wrong time. So if you riding and you want to stay with a particular group or group of people, make sure you stay close to them. All I'm doing here is riding comfortably because I know they're not going anywhere. I know I can pull them in. I'm not going to expend too much energy on the climb because they, they use their efforts at the wrong time. That's how come we ended up not, not waiting on, when they came to like a third stop during the ride. He pulled up looking behind. What are you looking behind for? You should have been with that first group, not letting us get gapped, and we would have all been riding together. Because you can see the guys on the road up there. This guy rides with more than them. He was off the back. He's trying to get up there. None of these guys will make it to catch those guys unless they slow down. So when you're riding and you see people doing that, don't kill yourself. Just hold your pace. Because if they could have been up there, they would have been up there. The people who are riding with Mo were paying attention. I wasn't planning on particularly riding with them, so I wasn't paying that close of attention. So once the gap opened, I wasn't going to expend the energy to get up there. Because we have a different plan today. But uh, it's a teaching moment. I wanted to make sure Paul got it on film. So you'll get a lot of people working hard at the wrong time. And you can see everybody spread out on this road in little pockets. We end up seeing more in them again, and you'll see I'll point it out at the, the light probably six or seven kilometers from, from now. So all these guys that are killing themselves on that first climb, you will see them again. All I'm doing is just riding. And guess who we're passing here? Mark, who caused the gap to open in the first place, killed himself on the first climb. 
Now he's got dead legs here. That's Jerry. Jerry was caught back there as well. And he's riding up to get up the mowing then. You just have to keep riding. You'll get up. So that's Doug's shot moving up with Jerry. I'm just holding our, our pace here. I tell Paul, it's time to go. <laughs> That's what happens when you ride within yourself. Now, you see the guy in the blue, with the blue strap on his jersey? That's Neville. He comes around us like he's flying. Watch. This is Mark here, who was killing himself, on the, who let the gap open, then went and worked really hard on that first hill. He's trying to rest here. Now, watch the line I'm going to take. That's how you take a line in a curve. There's no car coming. I'm not even pedaling. Look at me passing. Because I took the proper line. So you can carry more speed. I'm waiting for Paul to get on my wheel. And once he's in, I resume. That's Maurice. So all the people that were killing themselves on the climb are right here. We're passing them now. So my logic is this. If you can do that, why did you allow the first group to pull away? Why did you not use your energy at that stop sign to stay with that first group. This is the stuff we talk about all the time, which does not hold water with me. There's no point in letting them go and start working hard back here. What's the point of that? Because you're not going to catch them. I'm staying right at sweet spot. I can tell by the feel of my legs, my breathing, how everything, I don't even have to look at anything. I, I know I can do this pace all day plus more i could go harder if i wanted to but right here is all i need to stay in contact if if we had been up there we would have been able to sit in that group because we rode with them a few weeks ago you see i'm on the hoods and because of my position i'm not particularly 100 percent arrow you can see my arms when i really want to get lower my arms will be touching the bar at 90 degrees i'm just riding here. I'm going to let them know there's a bunch of people behind us. I'm letting them know the pavement's slippery. So don't get kamikaze. You see my line? The bike is relatively upright. That's what you do when it's wet. I'm waiting for Paul. You're better off doing it carefully to end it up on the pavement. You're not going to save any time taking risks. The guys are right up there. You, see, uh, you can see cyclists up the road. All I'm doing is holding the pace that works for me. All the people that went too hard on that first climb after more, most group pulled away, we've already passed them. They're sitting on our wheel right now. Because my pace is more sensible, it's steadier, instead of blowing the gasket and having to catch your breath. When it's, when it's time to go really hard, then you have nothing left. It's not a criticism of anybody. I'm just letting you guys know that you have to know what your capabilities are. In a race, it's even more important. If you go too hard too early, you won't be there to see the finish of the race. You're not going to place. But when you're resting, the race will go off the road. You have to stay within yourself and only go really hard when it's absolutely necessary. You see those riders up there? That's the distance to Mo and them. That's the group up there. Might be 30 seconds or so. There's no way I'm gonna make up 30 seconds on those guys. Not gonna happen. So you just keep riding. The road's going up here. And I make sure I use my gears properly. You can see the chain in the back. I'm all the way close to the, the larger cluster back there, larger cassettes. Probably in a 5323 or something. And apparently this is not fast enough for now this is mark who killed himself and had dead legs now look look at his cadence that's why he need time to re recover so when you ride like that people who are in the know when they attack you you can't respond because your gear is too heavy so they come around just slip in and then you know i'm riding within myself i stayed to the left i don't want to be sprayed i got a little bit on me when they went through that water this is what gets you dirty. After every rain, there are spots on the, on the route that has water over the road. Look at Mark's cadence. If somebody attacked him, he could not respond. And a road racer does not ride like that, so we know he, he's not a racer. That's how you know. A racer uses the smallest possible gear 
so he can always respond to changes in pace. If you are dry, riding a, uh, let's say a triathlon or a time trial, yeah, you can lower your cadence, but even what he's doing is too low. My goal is to just keep moving, because by keeping moving, I know we're not gonna waste any time. It doesn't really matter which group we're in on this ride, but what matters is that you don't go so hard that you blow up the group. And a lot of the guys we ride with don't think like that. You see my gearing in the back? I'm all the way up, probably in at 23 or 21, something like that. Look at my cadence versus marks. Look at that. And I'm doing 90, 91. So what is he doing, 60? I don't know, it's pretty low. You're not gonna last very long pedaling like that on a long ride or a hard ride. At some point, your muscles will need to recover. There's a time to train like that, but not during a group ride. Especially an aggressive ride. That's probably what happened when more of them pulled away because he was pedaling the same way. They just rode away, they did not attack. They just continued riding. Now, this is Greg. He had been with Mo's group and he's fallen off that pace. Says, we didn't start with Mo's group and we didn't plan on sticking with Mo's group. I still felt like we could have ridden with them had we been at the front. I just wasn't thinking about it at the moment. So, it's nobody's fault per se, but it, it shouldn't have happened. If Mark was gonna wave people over, Paul is just having a problem, I just ride around him here. They're pressing, I'm just staying, I'm keeping my effort the same. I'm not gonna lift my pace at all because I know they're gonna be tired in a little bit. So they do a lot of yo-yo, what I call a yo-yo kind of riding. Go really hard and slow down. So if somebody who, uh, if it were a competition, it would be hard pressed to make it first to the finish line. Because nobody's going to wait for you when you slow down. <laughs> you know? And so what happened, I, I believe, when Mo's group went through that stop sign, their legs were tired. Because they had gone too hard. Especially Victor, who killed himself on the overpass with Dan. Because the, the group was right there. So when Mark waved them through, they all saw the gap open and they could do nothing about it. Because their legs were dead. So when we get to this corner here, somebody, I think Greg uh, Shot is gonna say, uh, uh, Paul H is off the pace about 20 seconds, and they're talking about waiting. I just continue. This is, yeah, that's Greg. He's gonna let everybody know that Paul H is off the pace. So I, I turn the music off. Hopefully we can hear him. It's not very clear, he's not near the camera, but he's near me. That's what he's telling them. Paul H is off the pace about 20 seconds. I stand up and just go. Because Paul, Paul Ilunga asked, are we going to wait? I'm like, let's go. So you may be wondering, okay, why did you guys decide to go here and not wait for Paul H? Well, Paul H is one of the, I shouldn't call him a culprit, one of the offenders that, uh, similar to what I explained in that clip where we had Scott, we waited for Scott and then he went off the front and all that. Paul H does the same thing. You wait for him and he acts like you you didn't do him any favors. So we're not gonna wait for him. Unless he has a mechanical, which he ended up having later in this ride. We waited for him there on Bailey Grove. He had a flat and a cut on the tire. He got that fixed. But that's the first time here he got dropped. Then he gets dropped the, the second time after taking a long pull on this same ride. And at that point, it's just getting late in the morning. And Paul, I just told him, I said, guys, we gotta go. So we took, we went through tri legs. They didn't want to do tri legs anyway. There's a lot of hills there. We wanted more work. And it was just, we had spent too much time waiting at that point. So right here, we did not wait because uh, the last time we waited for Paul H, he went off the front. And I think I talked about it in one of the other videos. Uh, he, he got dropped on Bailey Grove after taking a flyer on the front. The, the one where we did the ride with Mount, on Mount Mariah with Doug Shot, and Doug Shot was tired of waiting too. But we go to ride those hills to ride them, not to wait for people. So they used their efforts at the wrong time, and they end up getting dropped. He was the one saying that his bike was heavy, so you know 
he didn't know how it was gonna go and blah 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 and I told him it's the engine not the bike. My Colnago is about 21 pounds with my water bottles probably 23. Feels fine to me. I've been riding. So we're just riding here and all I'm doing I'm keeping my effort the same. I don't care about the speed. A lot of people look at speed instead of what's going on. This is ninja grade here as one of our legends put it. This whole stretch is up. We're going up. We're, when we head north in this area, elevation is going up. We started like at 40 meters, now we're at 105. The whole ride you're going up. That's why I go north. I was, I was pleasantly surprised in December when I made one of the challenges on Strava with 8,000 meters of climbing. I did not believe we had that much climbing where we live. And I was just pleasantly surprised and I went back and analyzed my files and sure enough, by going north, I'm getting anywhere from 500 to 1,000 meters depending on where I ride, what route, what time, whatever. So I, I spent a lot of time riding my Colnago even though it's my heaviest bike. I love the feel. This guy is not riding with us, he's just somebody on the highway that's riding by. I don't pay him any mind. A lot, we, a lot of cyclists will go really hard just to pass another cyclist and then fizzle out and whatnot. I see that all the time. I don't change my plan when I'm out riding. I stood up there just to kind of change the way my muscles were working, release the pressure. And this is what Dan was talking about in the parking lot. You can see how my kit matches. You see the pink from the jersey on the arm and then the back of the shoe and then the writing on the shoe. All of that matches. Then the rest of the stuff is black. And then when the silver hits the sun, it looks white. That's the way. That's another rider who's not riding with us. So a lot of times when you're passed by riders, don't be concerned with it unless you want to use them as a, a rabbit to raise your pace. And if you choose to, you can do it either from a distance or just let them know. Ask to sit in their draft. Don't just start drafting people you don't know. That's kind of rude. You're in their personal space. This is Mark coming around and I believe that's Maurice. I lift my pace just a tad. I always pull to where I can lift my pace if I choose to. I, I rarely pull at max. If, I, if I'm at max, I'm alone. Because there's some part of the effort when you get to where you just can't go any faster. I'd much rather get there when I'm by myself. So Neville goes around and I pick up my pace a little more. Just a smidgen, just enough. I'm very stingy with my effort when I ride. This, this road is going up but it's right here it starts to flatten out. And it's going to start going downhill. See it says minus zero. I can tell by looking on the film because when you ride it, you feel it. Right here, it gets easy. And they know that. That's why they came around when they did. <laughs> and what, what ends up happening is we end up hooking up with most, most group like getting to them as the light changes in about a kilometer and a half. They were stopped by the light at Highway 105. So they were just riding, it's just that people had overextended themselves and let these gaps open. It's hard to close a gap to a fast group without really digging into your reserve sometimes. So you have to make sure it's worth your while. And it's better, it's easier to close a gap immediately as opposed to later. That's great shot coming around. That's Michael. See, Michael's socks matches his arm warmers. That's another way to really make yourself stand out. So the boys are getting it, man. I mean, it's like uh, everybody's picking up on what we, we talk about on the channel. I think that's really cool. I ride a lot. I'm riding in excess of 12, 12 hours a week, and so, I can tell that the other road users take me seriously because first of all, I communicate with them. And that makes a difference. You, 
can see here on this busy highway we're using the shoulder the shoulder is safe it's clean i'm wiping some of the crap off of me that some of the spray got on me from these guys i hate being dirty it's just little specks of dirt from their spray wiping it off my tights shorts the groups at the light more of them are at that light as soon as we get there it turns green See right there is green. They're, that, that's Moe's group at the light. They're going across. That's Moe's group in the middle of the intersection. They're getting across right there. There's a bunch of water down here. That's how you get spray on. See that? Even with the mud guards. So at this point, I told Paul, let's just kind of spin in because they're going to stop at Taco Corner. I tell him, yeah, let's just spin in. And then he waits until there's a gap. Then he changes his mind say, Let's ride with him. Let's not let him go. I don't, I'm not sure when he tells me that. He said, let's stay with him. Then I end up having a ride to close the gap. Because <laughs> right here, I'm taking it easy. Then he, yeah, he tells me, now you can see. I put the power down. We're going up a climb. This is one of the longer climbs on this route. I love this little road after 105. Very deceiving. So now he decides he, want, he wants to ride with him and I, I put the power down to ride up to him. You want to do that quickly. By the time I get up there, the pitch goes up. See where it says zero? It's like 0 0.7, 0 0.8. Now it says one. It's more than that. Now it says two. This is where you will see the gap open. Watch. I decided to just sit on Paul Edge. Remember Paul Edge was the one that wanted to wait for it back there. So he's killed himself to come back here. And instead of resting, he wanted to stay with those guys. Look at the gap open immediately. He was tired and would not take time off. This is what I talk about. He got dropped back there. They were talking about waiting for him. We just rode casually in. So on the downhill, he catches up. And now he's trying to keep up with those guys. Look at the two groups split. That's more of them at the front. And that's uh, the other team RR guys in the middle. Most group is at the front. Didn't take much to separate the groups again. I mean, you know, the, the, the quality is there. So I decided to just sit on Paul this year. I didn't. I was planning on warming down. And he's just, he's pedaling slower and slower and will not downshift. I'm in the high 80s to almost 90. He looks like he's doing 65, 70. You can't do that very long in these conditions. This road is going up. And there's wind and the wind is here. So after a little while I go around him. I don't know if it's right here. The boys are right up there. I can see them. You see them in the distance. This camera with a wide angle makes it look further than it is, but they're, they're not very close. I think Greg's shot is on our wheel. It's right here. Yeah, I'll go around him right here. I use my ears. I didn't hear any cars after that guy went by, and I used that to go around. You see Paulie Longa is on my wheel. And in a little while, I tell him, let's go straight. We're not going to turn right. They're turning right to go to that store. I don't want to wait at the store very long. So I tell Paul, we're going to do an extra loop of about maybe a mile. We use that to spin down, so by the time we get to the store, they've been there a while, so we don't have to wait very long. I don't want to wait. I want to keep riding. There they are. That's the, oh, that's the group. Most group is in front of where the arrow was. So most group turns right. Let's see, right there. Most group is going to turn after that car. They turn right. Some of them go straight. So, but I know the Team IR guys are turning right. I tell Paul, let's go straight. I don't want to go to that store and wait. That's the short way to the store. We go ahead and take the long way. So now, this part of the video, this is the last 90 minutes we got on Pony and Egypt Road. We met the guys at the store, rode with them through Bailey Grove. We ended up leaving them because they kept waiting. They were waiting for Paul H after he went and took another monster pull into the wind. And then shortly after that got dropped. And when they decided to wait for him, we couldn't even see him. So I didn't want to stand on the highway for another five or ten minutes. And we just we went through tri lakes. We needed to get back. So this is a little after four hours into our ride. We hit Monia Egypt Road.
heading south. This is around almost noon. I was telling Paul that we just need to do some rotations on this road and take advantage of this road. This road is a very fast road. I really like it. Fast in terms of you get on it and you just want to go. Pavement sweet. It's got, got some cracks and divots and stuff, but it, it's really just something about it. You get on this road, you just can't ride it slowly. So Paul goes by, hands me the camera, comes over. We're only using half of the road. The driver behind us saw us changing. He's waiting for this car to pass and then he'll go. And I just want to stress that what you see here with these drivers, this is the norm. This is what we experience most of the time. The few times you've seen on film where you know drivers passing in the in oncoming traffic or the other guy with the red truck that you saw earlier, that's those are outliers. But those are the situations that create problems in life. You know, most people drive to work every day, no accidents happen, but, but it does occur. So I don't want you guys to think that it's the norm of us having challenges. No, we ride a lot. We don't have any issues with traffic. Every so often, you always get that person or individual. You know, that's just life. So yeah, this is the norm. We, we're out there, we don't have any problems. So when it does occur, we don't make it take over our experience. We don't make one bad event ruin the ride. You know, we just go ahead and move on, dismiss it and move on. We, we make sure we don't escalate the situation. You know, if, if we have to, we'll, we'll get the numbers of the license and call the authorities. That, that's not very often. So all of those are outliers. Just want to stress that. Even in the busy parts of town. We had to let those guys go because they kept waiting and waiting to make stops. So we needed to keep our cycle time, moving time close. We let them go. We're on Holy Egypt Road, wrapping this up. Yeah, I decided to just make make that, you know, we, we rode with them after we did that extra loop, we got to the store, we, we convinced them to go through the forest with us, and they did. But once we got out there, Paul H. had a, a flat, so we stopped and got that fixed. Then we get on uh, Johnson Road, he takes this monster pull into the headwind, and when we hit 1486 after Johnson Road, he gets drunk. So maybe he shouldn't take pulls. So I was like, it was a, like the third time we would have been waiting. I'm like, the, the time was just getting wasted sitting around waiting. So we just told them we're going to take Tri Lakes, another challenging neighborhood that they didn't want to go through. I said, like, okay, guys, we're just going to head out. We can't keep waiting here. We couldn't even see him. So when you ride with the group, don't take a pole and then get dropped. You're wasting other people's time. So people need to learn that. And, you know, these guys haven't picked that up. Because if you keep waiting for them, they'll never learn. They'll leave them out there once once in a while they'll stop pulling when they should be saving their energy to stay with the group so right here on Honia Egypt Road this road is beginning to go up Paul and I the plan was to just alternate and take successive pulls so you can see the road going up it's gonna kick to the left I find the appropriate gear a lot of people get hung up on what speed they're doing. What you want to focus on is what cadence you're using in the gear in your end. Because if you want to get stronger climbing, you should be able to do the same cadence in a harder gear. That means you're stronger. And what enables you to do that is strength in your legs. It's not about your heart rate and all that stuff. Your heart's going to do what it's got to do to bring the nutrients to your legs. But your legs need to be able to turn a larger ratio at a certain cadence that equates into more speed. Because speed is cadence maintained for the distance. People always ask, how do I get stronger? That, that's the simple formula. The challenge is the right workouts to get you to, to get there. That's why you need structure in your training. So you can ride every day and if you use a baby gear all the time, you're not going to get very strong 
in the legs. You gotta build the strength of your legs by using decent sized gears at your prescribed cadences. There's a joke, uh, I don't know if it's official or not, but uh, you see Paul's cluster here. I brought the camera down so you guys can see our transition. I'm right on his wheel. Uh, this, somebody interviewed Mark, supposedly. I didn't read it myself. Heard about it, said that, is it better to spin a small gear or a big gear? And he said it's better to spin a big gear. <laughs> you know, I got the joke right away. You know, what are you gonna do? You know, you get whatever gear you're in, you need to be able to spin it. You need to be able to handle the gear. When I'm riding, I find a gear that I own in most critical moments. And if I don't own that gear and that's what I need, the next time I train, I'm going to be in that gear playing around with it to get to know that gear in that situation or on that climb. You're always worried about average speed and all that stuff. That doesn't mean anything. That's going to change with the conditions. What you need to focus on is your strength levels and your ability to handle decent ratios. Because if it's very windy, you're not going to be pushing a big gear anyway. You don't want to. It's just not physically possible. you got to push the largest possible gear that you can handle for that situation. It's always going to vary. So you've got to try to replicate the situation. So people started gravitating towards now the power meters. People look at heart rate monitors, which has variances based on weather, temperature, you know, different things. So yeah. So when you get to the top level and you're trying to refine your training, that's when it matters to have a power meter. I get a lot of people on the channel, they just started cycling, they want to know which power meter to buy. Go ride your bike. You need to know how to use a power meter. They're great tools, don't get me wrong. But you just like you don't put precision tools in the hands of an amateur, you gotta know what you're doing to really maximize the value out of your power meter. So at some point we'll bring power to the channel down the road when we get enough support or we get somebody to send us one. But right now it's not that critical. It's not gonna help you to see my power numbers. <laughs> you know, you need to see your power numbers. So those of you who wanna see power, get yourself a power meter and focus on your power numbers. Learn how to use power in training. Because just buying a power meter is not gonna help you. You need to learn how to use it. It's a specialty device even though it's getting more mainstream. A lot of people riding around with power meters getting dropped. You saw Mark waving people through. He's got a power meter on that bike. The power meter couldn't help him. Those guys rode away from him and his power meter. Paul H has a power meter. Doesn't help him either. So it doesn't mean anything. You need to be able to generate the power so the power meter can display what you've generated. A power meter is very humbling. You get that thing and you, you can't generate power, it will quickly tell you. All you're doing is 130 watts. <laughs> it can be humbling. So I come through here and continue to ride. And the wind's swirling around, you see my cadence is up. When you're at the front, you want to keep your cadence as high as possible, the smallest possible gear, so that you maintain your suppleness to react to changes in pace. Especially when you're riding with others. If you're riding by yourself or you're working on time trialing, that's different. Then you want to just focus on your cruising cadence. It's a different kind of riding when you're riding in a group than when you're riding solo. This just adds to the complication of cycling. That's why you never master this sport. That's why it's still interesting after all these years of riding. I learn something new every day about myself when I'm on the bike. Every day, every ride, something different. To add to the archives in my mind. I don't know why I love this road, but it's not the widest road out there. Um, but there's something about it just makes you want to work when you get on this road. It just almost seems disrespectful to get on this road and not go.
on the Egypt Road. So those of you with power meters don't get discouraged. They're good to have. Just make sure you know how to use them. Incorporate them into your training. All the people that I train, when they tell me to have a power meter, we use that as the primary source for their training. And I always suggest that they get a heart rate monitor so they can know what their body is doing. A power meter does not tell you what your body is doing. A power meter simply tell you what wattage you're putting out. It doesn't tell you what's going on with the internals of your engine. It may look like it's easy doing 33, 34 in these conditions, but it's not. I'm working here, but when you ride a lot, it looks smooth. You need to look like you're not going fast when you're going fast. And, and that's what training does. You don't need to be thrashing all over your bike. You need to look smooth when you're going fast. We're going fast here. This We're working. Because of all the training I've been doing over the years, and especially with the ramped up stuff we did in December, instead of my heart rate being like 160, it's like 141, 142, whatever. Um, I don't look at it when I'm riding, I'm looking at it on the screen as I narrate, but from feel on the bike, I can tell you that as I've increased my mileage, it takes a tremendous amount of work now to get my breathing to change. My body seems more efficient, my engine seems more efficient. So now what I focus on is making sure that my legs are optimized as far as the gearing I'm using so that I don't kill my legs. Because you can get too complacent, oh my heart rate is low, I gotta drive it up. Well, you need to make sure you're using the right ratio for the situation. I'm pulling those shorts down. When I put on the leg warmers or whatever, the, the shorts slide on, because they're over the leg warmers, they're not on my skin. So the silicone at the bottom does not grab very well. So they have a tendency to move a little bit. I don't like them to bunch up. You see where I've placed myself on the road? This is what I talk about. It's a narrow road. I'm riding where the right car, the car, cars ride. This is where motorcyclists ride as well. Uh, I, I learned how to ride a motorcycle a long time ago. I don't ride it, uh, you know. <laughs> my wife and family members frown on that. They don't mind me riding my bike, but motorcycles, but you know, just, I've ridden them, they're okay, but it's just, uh, they have this stigma, I guess. So it's not a popular idea for the people I know. There was a car behind, I was waving by. I guess Paul thought it was him, so I tell him. I was actually waving a car. That's what I told him. And I was waving that car over, but he came through. I said, okay, let him sit there. And I'll take the break. You see all the cars going in the other lane. They have to, because look at where we are. This is where a motorcyclist would be. On a road like this, that's where you need to be now. This is not a road for chatting, a conversational ride. You want to have a conversation? Stay in the roads with slower traffic, like the neighborhood roads and stuff like that. Preferably the ones that have like two lanes and in, in either direction, so you guys can take one lane and chat. The ones that don't, you've seen us in the Woodlands area where one person rides on the edge of the shoulder and we're not using the whole lane. So the drivers can see us with our heads down, we're working. They, they appreciate that you're working. So when you sit out there and you're chatting and looking like a, you know, like you own the road or, you know, it, it's just, it's just not courteous. It, it's kind of annoying, even though you have the right. 
you need to not impede the flow of traffic that's that's the key that's the key that's i'm glad i got that out you want to make sure that when you're riding you're not impeding the flow of traffic you're going as fast as you can for that area of that road and you're not just sitting there you know doing 10 miles an hour and talking with your buddy or your mates because there are roads for that this is not one of them look at that hill just pretty this is the road that was underwater the last time we came from the other direction Honia Egypt Road. So every time I come on this climb solo, I use a slightly higher ratio at the same cadence. That's how you get stronger. It's not very easy, but you've got to push yourself. Yeah, I'll go ahead and put the camera in my right hand. I want to get Paul's gearing. He stands. The camera's in my right hand now. So even though we battle with the gimbal's ability to function in cold weather, I prefer to use the gimbal because it steadies the camera. I moved that camera from my left to my right hand. You couldn't even tell if I hadn't told you. But you can tell by this shot that I'm filming from the right. Now I moved it to my left. Just that little hesitation. But the gimbal allows me to do that without messing up the shot because it keeps it steady. Now it's in my left so you can see the road now. If it were in my right, you would see more of Paul's cluster and so forth. So it's just nice that I can do stuff with that because of the gimbal without affecting the shot. The shot is smooth, it's not jittery. I'm telling him that I can shift holding the gimbal on the side of the brake hoods on my left from the small to the big chain ring. Cause you start, you have to throw that lever. We're working hard on this hill and I'm chatting with Paul. It doesn't mean it's easy, but when you train consistently, your aerobic capacity increases to where it takes a lot more work for you to get out of breath. You see my cadence in the 80s. I, I, I climbed mostly 75 to 75 to 90 thereabouts I try to stay in that range I don't think about it it just ends up being there it just seems to be very efficient it seems to be more efficient to go hard on a climb in in the 80s than in the hundreds for too long as far as the cadence is concerned for me everybody's different you have to find yours I hand Paul the camera here and because of the gimbal, the, the shot is still and smooth as we go by. And I take over the lead. If it says zero, it's not. This road right there, that's a bump. You feel it. You see now it flips to one or whatever. It might be 1.5 or two. You feel it in your legs. I don't really worry about it because even on my, my head unit, the reading sometimes is behind. I feel the thing kick in. Then the reading says, oh, it's 1.5. It's almost like it's after the fact sometimes. I'm sure it's getting it from GPS or however it's doing it. It does a pretty decent job. Technology is amazing. So you see how the pink from the back of my shoes, the band on my arm, uh, and then the, the, the jersey just blend. That's what Dan was talking about. I may have mentioned that before, but that's the stuff. I put a lot of thought into putting things together. They don't always work, but because this outfit worked, when I took that picture and put it on Strava, I decided to use it on, on a ride that we were filming. So I try them when I'm solo, but I check my outfits out, you know, in the mirror to make sure they, they work. I don't like to look like I didn't put any thought in the stuff. I don't just put anything together. It's important. When you look like you're serious about it, the other people out, out there would take you seriously. If you were an officer of the law wearing a dirty uniform, you, you wouldn't be received the same way as somebody who is in a night nicely pressed clean uniform you know and then you just be, be giving the other officers a bad rep 
you know, I may have mentioned that before. Same thing with the military. So, you, you, you know, whatever you're doing, you're going to work, I don't care what your job is. You don't need to wear a suit to look good. But whatever you're wearing, it needs to be neat. Take it seriously. That people would take you seriously. You see, look at how much room these guys giving us. I mean, we're all the way over. They're moving. You know, because, you know, that's just the way. This is the norm. Every now and then you get somebody who wants skin by elbow, but just don't let it run. I'm asking Paul whether we should go ahead and wrap it up here. And he wants to continue. Research and then turn it off from there. This is a good stretch. He said he wants to get the kit in the sunlight. That's what you hear him say. So the light's red, I check, no cars are coming. I'm using the shoulder, so I stay on the shoulder. Now we use the shoulder here. There's only two of us. And this time of the morning, the road is a little busier. We could use the lane, but it's not necessary. This shoulder here is nice and clean. I make sure I get that kit. <laughs> That's what he's talking about. He wants to make sure he gets the kit. And so I thought he meant the Strava segment. So I said segment, and I don't think he heard me in the wind. So there's a segment at uh, the, after the next light before we get to 1488. But we, we couldn't complete it because it, there was a bunch of traffic as we get through the light. So I go ahead and just start picking up the speed before we get to that light because the segment starts at the, at the next traffic light. I'm watching that car as it comes off. That, that's why I pay my attention. Who can impede my progress? I keep my eye on them. Even that guy coming out of the parking lot. See the outer car on the right. That's, that's what I pay attention to when I'm riding. What's up and coming? So there are no surprises. Now we get through the light, you'll see me lift the pace. Just a little bit at a time. Just keep lifting it, keep lifting it. I'm trying to keep my cadence right around 90 thereabouts. Anywhere from 90 to 100, I like to cruise. The wind's blowing a little stiffer. And I put a little more force into it. It's nice and warm, 17C, it's nice. So the after the credits you'll see, we're just thanking our patrons, all of you on Patreon, we appreciate you. It's because of you we're able to produce this video. That's why you're in the credits. The people in the community section have chosen to receive no rewards on Patreon. That's why I call them community. The other guys are getting rewards and different perks. So those of you who are not on Patreon yet, Patreon yet, go to patreon.com slash veloharmony and sign up. There's a lot of benefits. I've been rolling them out. You know, we're giving a lot of features. So uh, this is it. This is what we did on Saturday. Get out there and keep those doctors fired. Get your K's in. <laughs>